Um, I'm Molly Irwin from the Chief Evaluation Office in the Department of Labor, and I'm really happy to be here this morning and to be moderating this roundtable discussion on gaining access and maintaining confidentiality with administrative data. I think um, this session will be a really nice follow-up to, to the conversations that we've already had this morning, and I think will be a nice way to talk about some of the, the um, sometimes challenging issues and hopefully really good solutions that we have to gaining access to data so that we can move on and use the data in the cool kind of applications that I think we're going to hear about for the next day and a half. So I think this will be a good stage setting um, session. It's, it's going to be a roundtable discussion. We have um, four great panelists and then a discussant. I'll introduce each of them and then we'll go right into it and then have some time at the end for discussion with the audience. So the first person on the panel is Beth Green, who's the Director of Early Childhood and Family Support Research at the Center for Improvement of Child and Family Services at Portland State University. Her work focuses on managing, designing, and implementing studies of early childhood education and parenting programs, children's mental health, early literacy, child abuse prevention, community development coalitions, child welfare, and family drug courts. Next, we have Chuck uh, Michaelopoulos, who's the chief economist at MDRC. His recent work includes serving as a co-PI on two national evaluations of home visiting programs, as well as leading two evaluations of coordinated care for high-cost Medicaid recipients. All of these studies involve accessing and working with administrative data from different state agencies across multiple states. Maya Bernstein, right to my left, is a senior policy analyst and privacy advocate at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation in the Department of Health and Human Services. There, she advises on legal and policy issues involving the use and disclosure of personally identifiable information, including how and when it's appropriate to give researchers access to administrative data. Jennifer Noyes is the Associate Director of Programs and Management at the Institute for Research on Poverty and the co-director of the Center on Child Welfare Policy and Practice at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her work involves using administrative data within the state of Wisconsin, as well as across multiple agencies and states, including efforts to create files that link across administrative data sets. And finally, Kelly Maxwell, who'll be our, who will be our discussant, is a senior research scientist and co-director for early child Childhood ed, uh, Development at Child Trends. She's known nationally for her policy relevant research and evaluation focused on helping states improve their early care and education systems. So I think we are well set up to have a good discussion. And what I'd like to do to start out is really just to go down the row and ask all of the panelists just to give a couple sentences, a high level overview that describes their relevant experience working with administrative data. That's good. We'll start this way. Um, I mean, a couple of sentences. It's, so that, uh, you know, a couple of studies were mentioned. Uh, two that we're doing that right now are evaluations of home visiting programs where we're collecting um, three types of administrative data from 17 different states plus um, data from the new hires database. So that, that's, that'll be the base of a lot of what I'm saying, but I've been working with administrative data for a couple of decades. So, you know, I'll bring in, um, you know, some of those experiences uh, as well. And um, I think we'll be reinforcing a lot of what you heard in the previous, you know, the previous panel. So as was mentioned in my introduction, I spent a lot of time within our state um, working to integrate data across multiple state agencies and have been leading the development of what we call the multi-sample person file, which integrates data across about 12 state agencies, including the entire populations of, of, um, included in that data. One of my main functions is I work with other researchers to coordinate their data requests and to help get access 
and get all the confidentiality agreements and those types of things in place. I'm also involved in a similar um, cross-site national study that duplicates some of Charles' experience, but most of what I'm going to talk about today will draw on my in-state experience working across, as I said, multiple state agencies ranging from Department of Corrections, Department of Workforce Development, Department of Health Services, Department of Children and Families, our Department of Revenue with IRS records, that type of a thing. Hi. Uh, so I'm a, I think I have a little bit different role than the other people on the panel. I'm not a user of data. I'm a gatekeeper, I guess. Um, and so my perspective is going to be a little bit different. I guess that's why I'm here. Uh, I sp spend a lot of time working with people who are trying to get access to data. Um, and I, I, in spite of my title, I tend to be very pragmatic. Um, but I want to make sure that the data that people are seeking that there's a nexus between what they're trying to seek and what they're actually trying to accomplish. And oftentimes we find that people are, are trying to access data that is not the right data for their problem that they're trying to solve or the research that they're trying to do. Um, if I, and I, you mentioned the National Directory of New Hires, uh, I started my federal career at the Office of Management and Budget where we cleared the legislation, the paperwork, the, all the things that set up the National Directory of New Hires and since then have been reviewing all of the many requests for access for it. And so I'm always looking for the nexus between what the data is that we have and what the research problem is, the research question is, or the administrative problem that someone is trying to solve and making sure that that's right. And if that's there, I'll go to bat for people, but if it's not there, you know, there's not a very good argument for access to the data. Um, and um, I have had most recently a couple experiences with administrative data. I'm primarily a program evaluator and researcher. Um, so take coming at it from that side, one of the people trying to get access, um, using it primarily for program evaluation experience in a variety of different contexts. Um, the two most recent uh, are a um, retrospective evaluation of the Early Head Start National Study, which was done uh, from, started in the late 90s actually, and involved 3,000 children across 17 states. And about seven years ago, um, we received some funding through some various state agencies to go back and try to see if we could dig up child welfare administrative records for those 3,000 families um, and go retrospectively, so using the administrative data that way. And so we've gotten now seven, we got data originally in the first study from seven different states and we're in the process of accessing that data uh, for the remaining 10 states currently. Um, the second study involves a randomized trial within the state of Oregon where we're looking at the effects of a home visiting program and linking data through seven different administrative data sets within the state. So very different experiences. Great. With that, let's start now to really um, get each of your views about what the biggest challenge you faced in accessing administrative data understanding what it actually means or maintaining confidentiality and those are all really big questions that we'll dive into a little bit deeper but maybe just a high level overview from each of you and maybe we'll start with Beth this time and then head that way. So it's a little bit difficult to say what the biggest challenges are. I felt like every single challenge we've had was mentioned by Dr. Petrillo this morning when he was going through his list. I was like, oh yeah, that's happened. Oh yeah, that's happened too. Oh yeah, that's happened too. Um, everything from you know people saying we can't do it because it's against our legal statutes to we don't have um, the resources to give you the data you want um, to challenges once you get the data and storage and security and analysis. Um, I would say I would say that the, if I had to pick the biggest challenge, it would definitely uh, have to do with working with the state agency partners um, who vary tremendously in their capacity to respond to these kinds of requests, um, as well as their level and sophistication in doing so. Uh, we noticed huge, huge shifts even from the first phase of our early Head Start study, which we did about seven years ago in the level of sophistication, which is good, around state agencies thinking about how to create data use agreements and data sharing agreements. Um, this is specific to child welfare administrative data. Um, but the resources and the capacity at the state level has been a huge challenge. 
Um, and even trying to deal with that challenge by building money into our grants to provide funding to them, to release staff time, to help us respond to the requests, things like that. Um, in many cases, it's just a matter of time and trying to get to the top of their queue um, in terms of responding to your requests. So that's probably been the biggest challenge, I would say. Um. The biggest challenge for me. <laughs> uh, I think, um, well, one of the things is what I, I sort of mentioned before, which may be a theme throughout, which is making sure that the person, that we, that we know what the data is and what the problem is, and defining that problem and, and defining the nexus between the data, as I mentioned. But I think, um, I try to think about when, when people are trying to access administrative data, the kinds of studies that we heard about, the kind of things that you're doing, many of, that, many of these administrative records are about particularly vulnerable populations. People have to give us a lot of information in order to get the services that we're providing. And for me, I like to try to remember and to try to remind the people that I'm working with that this is enough, that, that, the, that the use of data for various kinds of research purposes or other administrative purposes that are different from that for which they were originally collected is potentially another vulnerability for this population. If we don't carefully safeguard the data, if we're not concerned about how we're using the data and how it's reported, that this is sort of just another vulnerability. And so I, I, I try to remind people that underlying all the work that they're doing, yes, we're doing good and yes, we want to improve outcomes and all the good things that we're doing, but we don't, we're not entitled to this data. Most of the data is given to us voluntarily by people who want to get services or, you know, if you think about the position people are in, maybe not so voluntarily. And so I like to try to remember to be respectful of that when we're thinking about using the data and to be careful and to try to use the minimum amount we need to get the job done and to be and, and, and to remind ourselves that if, we, if people are not confident about what we're going to do with the data and how we're going to use it and how we're going to report our results, they might not give us the data in the first place and then we're nowhere. So my challenge builds off of that, but in a bit different direction. And it is the challenge has been mentioned several times already this morning that the data that we're trying to access and use was not created for research purposes and it was created for other purposes. And one of the challenges that I have faced in, in working with and trying to be the bridge between some of the researchers with whom I work in the state agencies is to get the researchers to understand that it's not a one-way street, that going in to ask for data that they might not understand or that wasn't developed for the purposes that they want to use it for and they need to invest time to understand it um, requires a reciprocal relationship back to the agency owners or the agency providers that there has to be something in it for them, that it can't just be please let me have your data and I'll, see, and I'll walk away and never speak to you again about it um, because otherwise you can't get the buy-in, in my opinion, the long-term over time buy-in. Um, I call uh, two essential ingredients, the two T's, the trust and the time, that if you aren't, um, there's the there's an agreement that you have uh, in terms of confidentiality and privacy with the, with the human subjects that provided the information, but then there's the agreement I believe that you have to have with the agency owners, the data owners, to give something back to them for what it's going to take for them to give it to you. So if it's a one-way street, it's not going to work. And it's certainly not going to work over time. And if you want to develop long-term relationships, you have to um, spend that time to develop that trust. If it's just a one-off, you want to pull the data once and walk away, I don't think that's healthy or smart. And um, that has been one of the biggest challenges, I think, in terms of working with researchers who want to use the data and then also convincing the agencies to get in the game with us. Um, I, I agree with all the challenges that have been talked about, and I think we've faced them as well. Um, but if I have, yeah, since we were asked to pick a biggest challenge, I would say, uh, especially in the context of a federal study, like the home visiting studies we're doing, time is the biggest challenge, the time it takes to accomplish all of the things that are required. Um, I mentioned we're working with you know, two or three state agencies um, to collect Medicaid data, birth certificate data, and child welfare data across um, uh, 12 states for child welfare and 17 for the other two data sources. So it's quite a few state agencies. And you know, as we've heard, there's a multi-step process of contacting the agency, you know, developing a relationship with them so that they understand what you're, you know, what you're trying to 
get and that they're interested in, in helping you out. But that's just the, the easy part in some ways because then there's usually a data committee or an IRB that has to review an application, um, they have to review a consent form that you've spent a lot of time carefully crafting for your national study, um, <clears throat> and they'll you know, probably want you know, changes to. Um, and then finally, there's a data use agreement uh, which you know, has to be negotiated um, in part because, again, for these two federal studies, there are restrictions on what we can do with the data from the federal government's perspective. Uh, and those don't always agree with what, how the states want us to use the data. So negotiating those has definitely been um, time consuming. I think overall, um, we've, we've signed agreements with most of the agencies we've talked to. But it's taken, on average, about a year, a year and a half, I pro uh, probably, for each agreement to get signed. Mm -hmm. So within the context of a four or five year study, which is one of the ones we're doing, where you're also trying to recruit sites into a study, recruit sample members into a study, and then you know, get the data use agreement signed in time so that your consent form can be used for recruiting s sample members, there's definitely a big time crunch. Um, so we're hoping you know, the data come in on the, the exact day that uh, we're expecting it from the states so that we can write a final report. In the study, so I think, yeah, building in enough time for those kinds of transactions is really the the big thing that I would emphasize. Great. So thinking sort of to the beginning of the process, what recommendations do all of you have for how researchers can or what? they should do to do their homework before requesting the administrative data. And I know some of these things have already been talked about this morning, really understanding what different administrative data are available, what data are in a particular data set, things like that. What should we really be thinking about up front before we even make the request? So I'll jump in. Okay. Let me jump. Um, I think one of the big challenges we've already touched on multiple times, but is this issue of clarity and of what you're trying to accomplish. You know, Maya has brought it up. It, it, it's come up in every presentation so far. And one of the things I think researchers really need to do is think about the question that they're really interested in and what it might mean when you're querying the data. I know that um, Maria this morning really talked about getting a thinking about it as you're sampling a population, and um, she and I think a lot alike in relationship to that, that it's not just simple, ma simply a matter of asking for data fields and walking away. From my perspective, one of the key thing pieces of homework that needs to be done is spending time with the people who actually understand the data to figure out what you should be asking about. Um, really a big key challenge is thinking about talking about what you're trying to accomplish, what is it that you're actually trying to answer, so that you can go through and really describe the population that you're interested in, the unit of analysis that you're interested in, the time period, your definitions of program participation, what it is you're actually talking about. Because a lot of times as outsiders coming into data, we don't necessarily understand what it represents. And so I think there has to be a big investment of upfront time so that you're not wasting time after. It's, it takes a lot of time to get access. And you want to make sure that the information that you're accessing is what you think it is, and it's going to help you answer the question. Um, and you might not need, as was mentioned this morning, everything that you think you need. We have been renegotiating and just finished our um, data sharing agreement with our Department of Corrections to update it. And one of their big hangups was we wanted information about the institution from which a offender was being released. And it turns out that some of the institutions from which the offender is being released, actually, if we knew what that were, we would know their mental health status. We would know information that's protected under one of the other things that was discussed this morning. And I, and it was this huge hang up with the attorneys for like two months. And I finally said, we actually don't care. You can mask that data. But we hadn't understood when we'd asked for that field that that's what we were gonna get. And so, in my opinion, you know, it goes back to the investing the time up front. Um, to talk with the people who actually own and understand the data so that you know that what you're asking for is, is going to actually answer the question that you think is going to answer and also you don't get more than you need because that will save you problems later on. I, I would agree with yeah. that. Just a second, I was thinking the same thing. I think when you talked about, think about what you really need and think about where you can be flexible. Like, here's our master list of all of the things that we're interested in looking at, con conceptually thinking through that research question. But then, here are the not sort of for, for the research project to even be worthwhile doing, here's the information that we need to have. Um, and be able to be flexible around that because I think in that initial, the initial phase of being a researcher asking for data is really about relationship building. And so to the extent that 
Um, you can be very flexible and open and sort of try to have that kumbaya experience. Um, I think that's really important. A keep that kumbaya experience past the first meeting, I should say. I, I think the other thing I would just add too is that one of the pieces of homework that I didn't anticipate would be as challenging as it was, was just figuring out who in the agency do I go to to ask? And sometimes that turns out to not be that obvious. Um, and I have learned because I'm not a person who picks up the phone easily, and I don't think now we do. We do most of our contacts via email. I've learned that the best way to get that information is by picking up the phone and calling somebody and finding out who is the person I need to talk to. And I think I'd second both the things you know, Beth said. I think in our case, you know, we kind of knew which data we wanted. We had an experienced research team that had used all the data sources that we were trying to get. So we um, you know, understood them, not you know, every detail in every state, but understood the basics of them and knew that we wanted them. Um, but uh, both the flexibility was really important. I think the place where flexibility played the biggest role in our, you know, our work was being willing to live with de-identified data if that's all the state could give. In most cases, the vast majority were able to get identified data, so we can link them across data sources, do lots of interesting analyses. But yeah, you know, we're willing to get de-identified data if that's all a state is willing to give us, and usually it was because of legal restrictions. Um, and then, the, and just echo, we also had um, you know, the issue of who is the right person to contact you know, at the state getting the right name, do you start at the top, do you start at the data person, um, and that sort of thing. And um, getting those people to respond is, you know, is, is you know, probably one of the toughest things. So I see a lot of, we have a, week, we have a log of activities in, you know, in doing data acquisition, and you see lots of things like sent an email to somebody, two weeks later, called them, you know, two weeks later, you know, followed up again, and you see that you know, going on. And it's not, it's not surprising because they have lots of other responsibilities. What we're asking them for is not necessarily at the top of their list of things to do. When we work directly with states on things that they're interested in, the data come very quickly and um, a lot more easily. I was going to add that um, in part of the planning for your work, at some point you're going to come across somebody like me. And you should think about that in advance. Uh, and you should try to make it easy for somebody like me to say yes to what you want to do. And one of the ways to do that is to have thought about the whole life cycle of the data that you're going to collect up front. So you want to think about how you're collecting it or gathering it, how you're going to use it, how you're going to manage it while you have it, um, how you're going to report out your results, and eventually how you're going to dispose of the data or archive the data at some point. What is the end of this? You might not know all of that up front, but it's good to have in mind the entire life cycle so that someone like me knows that you planned and you thought about it. Um, and you can get help for each of those steps along the way. But um, I think it's important to kind of have a, an overview before you start of all the way through the project what is, what is going to happen next and where you're going to end up. So just to follow up, a lot of you focused on finding the right person. What's even the right kind of person? I mean, I think there's somebody like Maya. I think Maria this morning talked about maybe getting in touch with the person who's entering the data or a case manager. Who, how, what's the homework even to do to figure out the right questions and then to find that person? There's the legal person, there's the privacy officer, there's the person who knows what's actually in the database. So from our experience, um, because we've been working with the different state agencies for so long and over time, when we go to bring in a new one, uh, in terms of working with us, like our Department of Public Instruction, we always do the pitch on what's in it for them. So we go to the program person first to make the sell of if we have access to this data and can do research questions. And here is the, here's the question that we're interested in. Is it interesting to you? And if it's not interesting to you, is there something that we can add to make it be interesting to you to develop an advocate within the agency who will go to bat for us? Um, and that has worked very, very well over, over time. We as an institution, the Institute for Research on Poverty, has also had the luxury, we have a lot of, we have a very symbiotic relationship with the state agencies with whom we work, so I come from um, being a data owner and understand our, the data systems to where, from where I came and have a lot of connections back into the agency. But we didn't have a connection, as I said, with our Department of Public Instruction, but we found somebody in their evaluation area who was very interested in using data, and we figured out a very first project that we needed the data for the research we were interested in, and then, like I said, we tacked on what they were interested in, and then from there they could tell us, now we need to talk to our legal counsel, now we need to 
talk to the, you know, basically this person's boss. Um, and it wasn't, it was a blind call, but it wasn't blind in so much as we knew the program that we wanted to work with. So, so a follow-up, Jennifer, what are some of the hidden costs um, to using administrative data and what can researchers do to anticipate or minimize those? So to me, the big, huge hidden cost is actually not so hidden because Charles talked about it and I was just talking to Bob about this, Gerga about this, is do not underestimate the time, the time. So you can talk, think about the cost of the servers and you can think about the cost of cleaning the data, which I actually think is a big, is a big investment. Um, it's not just pushing the button and, and getting the data. You have all this upfront time to get access to the data that you, that you need to build into any schedule that you have. Um, you have the time that you need to invest in working with people like Maya. Like the thought, there's a lot more thought that goes into this ahead of time than I think people um, realistically build into their schedules. And then even once you have access, I think there's a lot more time that goes into understanding if you've never used the data before, um, the data that you're going to get. And the, there's a hidden cost to the agencies with whom you're working because you're going to be pestering them to help you understand what's there. And again, from my perspective, if you show them how it's a value to them to invest the time with you, that they're going to get something out of it, you can make more progress. I, I do think that we, as researchers, can have, make an assumption that we know what's in the data. And I'm going to say we might think we know what's in the data based on our past experience, but if you're working cross states or cross jurisdictions, they don't have to put the data in the same way across states or across jurisdictions and on this national project that we're working on that's pulling in administrative data from eight states and trying to get their code books and trying to get them to, for us to understand what their fields are, um, there's not consistency. So we know our Wisconsin child support data really, really well, having worked in it for many, many years, and now we're pulling in information from multiple sites and the amount of time that we have to invest because code books don't exist or whoever wrote the code book is gone. Um, so to me, a main hidden cost is, is the cost of your time as a researcher, the cost of the time on the, on the end of the agency who's helping you, the cost of the time of the legal staff and getting information to them. Um, and then we just had a case where we invested two years in a, in a data sharing agreement that came over, so I work in the university setting, um, came over and because it involves HIPAA data and we were we had to reprove sort of internal to the university our HIPAA protections, which were in place, but the amount of time that took the, con the, the data sharing agreement expired from the state agency with it had to be signed within 60 days. The 60 days elapsed. We got everything in place to get our signatures from our legal staff, sent it back over to the state agency. A new person has come in. Now they want to review the agreement again. Okay, we've been working on this now for two years. Um, Luckily, we built in a, a huge, huge, you know, lead time. So to me, as I said, a big hidden cost, which isn't so hidden, but is the time. Does anybody else want to jump? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. We have, I just got an email on Monday, actually, from one of the states that we've been trying to set up an agreement with for almost two years, almost two years to the date, saying, I think we finally have someone who can review your request at our legal office. So you've moved to the head of the queue. And this is after two years of, I mean, we have a project manager who I, who self-describes as a friendly pit bull. I mean, she is on these places because you have to be. If you don't keep following up, which is another time, I mean, it's not, you're, you're not getting the data, but you're spending a lot of time recontacting and recontacting and recontacting and trying to be friendly and trying not to cross that line between being sort of a stalker and just really annoying to, gentle, friendly um, reminders and check-ins on sort of where things are moving along. So that time has been huge. No cost extension has been <laughs> like something that we've had to ask for many times um, because you just can't get it done in a short period of time with three years being a short period, five years being somewhat longer. Um, I would also say, and I think this is important, everyone keeps speaking about um, the fact that these data sets are messy. Um, and I, as a, I was trained as a psychologist and, you know, as graduate student, and my graduate students tend to be trained to work with these nice, clean, flat survey data files that, you know, have all the nice documentation of exactly what variable everything is. Um, that is not the case for administrative data sets and actually finding people with the skill set who can put these data sets together really at the technical level um, is harder than you would think. 
Um, we, had, we had just had a recent hiring experience where we have learned that you can't just ask interview questions when you're hiring someone to do this kind of work. You actually have to give them a task and ask them to do it. So give them a data set and ask them to reconfigure it in certain ways and to look for these things in the data. We had several very experienced analysts who basically could not even start to tackle that problem. And we'd have never known that in the hiring process if we hadn't asked them to do something hands-on. So that's been a lesson learned that I think is important. I just wanted to also say it's important not to conflate, because I've heard both mentioned here, the question of which data sources you want from the question of what's in them and how do you use the, you know, the data sources. So for example, you know, one of the questions in one of our home visiting studies is the effect of home visiting on Medicaid costs and Medicaid use. So it's clear Medicaid data you know, on claims and encounters are going to be a good source of that information. But each state, you know, um, puts their Medicaid in different forms, and so understanding exactly what is in each state's system is, is taking a lot of time, even though we knew that was the data source that we wanted to get in each state. Well, and for example, these things change over time. We used to, do, we did a lot of work in the state of Oregon with their um, addictions and mental health data sets, and it used to be quite a great source of data, fairly accurate. It was used as a billing system, so people, treatment providers who wanted to get paid, actually put their data in. Um, and then a few years ago, for some reason, I don't understand, it is no longer a billing system, and the data, even the state research agency folks will say, oh, I'm not sure you really want to trust this data if you're looking at something like, how did this program increase the rate of access to treatment services, for example, because half of the treatment providers we work with don't put data into the system. So I can kind of jump in on sort of this theme. So one of the things that we have definitely learned, and we've talked about integrating data across systems, and is that different data systems privilege different data and that you can, if it's important to that program, that set of data is gonna be more reliable and easier to use, like Medicaid claims, than if, this, if it's information that is nice to be inputted for case management or other in administrative purposes, but it doesn't really matter, then so there's this hierarchy across all the data systems that you're gonna use about which fields are more or less believable, you know, sort of like the, I don't know what the right word would be, but um, we have learned working across all these different systems in terms of going to the probabilistic matching that we're using to be able to create a flat file that's one person across time and then connect to their case or to their parent or whatever it is, is that there, are, as a third party sort of arbiter to try to bring the systems together, um, one system might be, won't want to have their information necessarily overridden, but if you can get a social security number from UI wage records, then it's probably much more valid than anybody who would have picked a social security number in a child welfare um, record, right? And so you learn that over time, different things are more or less going to be valid. And if it's really important to the program, like claims data or utilization data in, in, the, in, the, on, in the medical area, or um, some familial relationships maybe in a child welfare data set, then we choose to privilege that that information in the data set and ignore maybe if there's conflicting information in a different data set. That's, I, and in my mind, that's the only way you can bring things together. Um, and again, that's a hidden cost because you have to learn enough about the program or be working with people enough about the program to get them to tell you what is, what is important to them or not, right? And, and, and just because it's there doesn't mean it's true. <laughs>
you know, across 40 state agencies that we were trying to work with, um, you know, for the, for the studies. So in that sense, if you can find a federal, you know, national database like the new hires data, or if you can do your work with the SSA data or, um, you know, um, you know, disability data, um, yeah, or that sort of thing, then you should definitely do it. There are other restrictions for new hires. Um, you know, you have to be, you have to be showing them that you're, you're providing some uh, information of interest to the agency that has the data, you know, the Office of Child Support Enforcement. So not anybody can use them, but if you're, you know, if you can do that, then it's good. In our case, we were working with um, folks at uh, ACF, so they were able to actually do all of the negotiations. So it was a lot easier for us to get access to the new hires data because somebody else did all the negotiation uh, in, you know, within the same agency than it was to, you know, to get it for the state. But I think um, all the challenges we talked about for state agencies apply and the key is I think being flexible. We talked about who should you be contacting and the answer again is all of the above. Like anybody who you know, might be helpful, you know, sometimes we started with a data person and they were great and they helped work our way up to the right people. Sometimes that didn't work and you know, we, in one case we talked to the um, Medicaid medical director, and you know they were able to you know to help us figure out the right person and get things. So it's really just being flexible and trying everything you know that you can. So I'll just keep echoing from our experience in terms of building relationships. Is as I said, trying to. Um, I think our success in gaining access has really been, on the state level, has been uh, to think about this as an over time, a long term horizon, and to figure out a way to at least demonstrate initially uh, from maybe a limited access to the data to show that we can be responsible and develop research that is of interest to whoever provided the data, and then to build that over time to the point where, where our goal with every agency with whom we work is to have more of a master data sharing agreement that is general around the provision of the entire data set and then as we have specific projects we add it as addendums or attachments. One of the ways that has been very successful lately because everything that we do is crossing state agencies is using integrated data, excuse me, data is that when we're working on a research project that involves multiple um, state agencies that we want to get permission to use their data is we pull together meetings with all the actors together instead of going one by one by one because the biggest challenge will be perhaps we have a, a, a question of interest to the Department of Public Instruction that is going to involve using data from our Department of Children and Families and instead of going to pitch it to the Department of Children and Families separate, we get the people in the room together to show what's of utility across all of their programs and so even though we have separate data sharing agreements with each agency, we at least get buy-in managerially or at the top level that this is what um, wants to be supported. So for us within the state, it definitely has been a long-term investment. And again, building on, I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, get your foot in the door and build from there. And, and that's what we have been able to do. Um, but I'll sound like a broken record if people talk about broken records anymore, about this whole relationship building and that in my mind to gain access and to maintain it, you need to show what's in it for other people, not just for yourself as a researcher. Yeah, and sometimes that's more challenging. Like I think of our situation where in our early Head Start study, we were trying to go back and look at this um, very large sample. We t collected uh, for that original study lots and lots of survey and um, assess child assessment data. And actually I see Louisa back there. She knows a lot about the early Head Start study. <laughs> Um, and then look and see, did this, does this early childhood program have an impact on child maltreatment outcomes? And so we're working with child welfare agencies who maybe have sort of a general interest in child abuse prevention and building that evidence base, but there's nothing really, really in it for them. I mean, we tried as hard as we could. We, you know, we said we'd share back their data, we would you know, do whatever we could to help, help them understand the findings, but really they have to say, okay, we agree that this is a, an important potential contributor to the evidence base around child abuse prevention. That said, I will tell you that we did run into one agency because this was actually for a different study with child welfare where we were trying to do a cost benefit analysis of child abuse prevention and we wanted access to cost data from the child welfare agency and the person said, so if your results are positive, you're going to basically have data that helps provide a rationale for cutting our state agency staff. 
you know, we thought it was great. Child abuse prevention is a good thing. Everybody wants that. And I'm sure this person did too. But when push came to shove, she said, aren't you basically saying that child welfare agencies are spending more than they should and we could actually be putting the money in prevention? And in a state budget, which is tight, maybe not such a positive thing. So getting that buy-in can be more or less difficult. Um, can I just mention too, we talked a lot about buy-in, but um, part of, you know, this is another example of being flexible. We had one state agency that didn't want to know the results of our evaluation. So, you know, that makes it a little bit more challenging to get buy-in, like we can tell you some great things that are happening. Because <laughs> they had a program that they thought was effective, they were getting, it was getting funded by the state, and they didn't want results out there that would suggest the opposite. Similar to, I think, what Beth was talking about. So that was a case where we, you know, we promised, don't worry, we're not going to reveal your state's results to anybody, nobody will ever know you know, whether it was effective where, you know, where it was. Um, and, you know, that was already our intention anyway. We had to go one step further and say, when we release a public use file for this, we'll make sure that nobody will be able to identify your state and be able to produce, you know, state results. So it sounds like many of the things that you guys are talking about are, are the same across different levels. Are there, is there anything that comes to mind that's different if you're working at the local level versus the federal level in terms of laws, regulations, the folks you would be talking to, how you get in the door, the homework you would be doing? Or are these, these strategies and issues pretty consistent across levels? I can't speak to the federal issue because we've never tried to access a federal database, but we've accessed state and county databases and they, they feel the same um, to me in terms of the process. I mean, every state is completely different, right? So each one has a very different process and different kinds of hoops you have to go through and different kinds of barriers to that I learned. I thought once we got a few states to agree to come on board, it would be easy to convince the other ones. Um, we were working in a situation this for the early Head Start study where we kind of a difficult a combination of factors where we wanted identifiable level, child level data. We did not have consent, so we were operating through a waiver of authorization of informed consent. We wanted this historical data. Um, but once we got a few states to agree, I thought it would be a piece of cake, but no, it was not. I will say that some states that you think would have a state agency database um, do not. So, for example, Pennsylvania does not have a state child welfare database. <laughs> Um, so they have 90-something counties in the state of Pennsylvania, so if we wanted to get data that was comparable to our other states, we would have had to go to 90 different counties and negotiate 90 different data sharing agreements, which obviously was not in our budget to do that. So that was an interesting lesson learned. I think one difference is, um, you know, at least for the federal databases that I'm familiar with, they're, you know, the agency that is you know, that has them, is familiar with research, has worked with researchers, um, and so the issues around how to use the data for research are pretty clear. We definitely talked to state agencies where no one had ever asked them for, you know, for the, the data that we were asking for for research purposes, at least for the kind of study we were doing. So they weren't even sure how to proceed, who to talk to, what the legal you know, restrictions were, uh, and so on. So I think that's, that's definitely you know, a pretty, um, pretty substantial you know, difference that makes it much easier in a lot of ways to use federal data, even though there are, you know, some some drawbacks of those as well. And I think if you talk about local data, that it becomes even more the case that you don't necessarily have the capacity locally. People um, will be a lot more conservative either in terms of understanding. It will go one of two ways. Either they'll be super loose because they don't have a legal person who's telling them that they can give it to you, or they'll be super conservative because they're not quite sure if they can. And then even if they want to be cooperative and um, work with you to access the data, they won't necessarily have the capacity on staff to actually help you get that done. They won't know quite how to get it, uh, like local jail data, that type of thing. They don't have someone just to task, give the task order to or something like that. So, well, I to go you, jump you did ask gonna, about gonna, legal gonna, and regulatory stuff. I was going to turn. Go, go ahead. You want to. So I was going to, <laughs> well, I was going to, and I bet this is where you're going. I was going to turn to you and ask who the various stakeholders in the decisions are about accessing administrative data, what can be shared, how the data can be used. Okay. Uh, you know, your most important stakeholder is your program people, right? They're the people who own the data. And their, you know, their first priority is their program. It's not your research. They still have to run their program. And so when you talk about taking time away 
um, you know, cajoling them and all that. They're, they're working on managing the program and trying to fit in your perhaps ad hoc request for research data in the middle of that. And so I do quite a lot of work with OCSE on the National Directory of New Hires and I know that they are very concerned about being, you know, true to their main mission, which is child support enforcement. That's what the database was created for. And so even though we have um, statutory requirements to share data with various other programs, um, for other administrative purposes, uh, it's still their priority is protecting the data for the original purpose for which it was collected, which is child support enforcement. And I think all of the programs at whatever level of government that you are looking at are going to have that same view of the world. So that's one thing. Um, at the federal level, which is where my expertise is, um, I can't help but um, point out that Sunday was the 40th anniversary of the implementation of the Privacy Act of 1974. You might ask how that is since it's 2015 and not 2014. <laughs> the law was, pa was signed by President Ford on December 31st, on New Year's Eve, 1974, but the implementation date was the following September. And so it's 40 years Sunday. Um, and most all of the databases we're talking about at the federal level are going to be covered by the Federal Privacy Act. P federal Privacy Act is not that private, but it does have a, a statutory provision that says you may share the data for research if it's in un non identifiable form. That is just not that useful, it turns out. Right? Most of the time when you're doing your research, you want identifiable data at least to create your initial database for doing your research. You want to link it to something else. And without those identifiers, you can't link it. So that's not that useful. And we have other ways um, in the Privacy Act of, of allowing the data to be used if it's compatible with the reason for which the information was collected. And compatibility is not defined in the Act, so we have a lot of wiggle room there. I should say, by the way, I am not legal counsel at my agency. I'm in the policy arm of the secretary, even though I, I, do, I am a lawyer by training, but I'm not practicing law at the department. Um, and so that, that might be another hint that there might be somebody else who's not the legal counsel who can help you, who's, whose job it is to think about policy matters and what makes sense for the agency and its programs rather than the legal counsel who is, let's say, a little more constrained, uh, perhaps. Um, the other big law that you're probably dealing with a lot, people mentioned HIPAA already, um, and you talked about whether different agencies are covered by different laws and different state levels, that's absolutely true. Um, so for example, if you have data that's coming from the federal Medicaid or Me Medicare program, there are HIPAA, CMS is a HIPAA covered entity. It's covered by HIPAA, it's also covered by the Privacy Act. But if, you mo if the data moves to another part, even to moves to a ACF, it's no longer covered by HIPAA because ACF is not a HIPAA covered entity. It's still covered by the Privacy Act. If that data moves to a state, Okay, it might be, you know, it might be covered by HIPAA because it's a covered entity, it's the public health agency, for example, and they're actually billing electronic claims or they're, they're actually a provider or a plan, their Medicaid agency, for example, but it's not covered by the Privacy Act, which only covers federal agencies, right? So with, with respect to the privacy of data, the rules do not follow the data around. They follow the custodian of the data. And so for each custodian of the data, you're going to have a little bit different set of rules and you have to find the person who's the custodian of that data to help you understand what the rules are with respect to that data set. Um, and so when you're matching things up, you're going you're gonna to maybe come across different kinds of privacy rules. There are also ones, for example, OCSE has its own rules under the, the Welfare Reform Law from 96 that specifically protect that database and say it shall not be used, right? for anything except. That's the typical structure of a privacy law. And in the case of the National Directory of New Hires, it's you know, 4D programs, it's social security, and it's earned income tax credit. And then since then, we've had statutory exceptions that add new uses. But for that data, you need a statutory exception every time. If you're not in those, you're not getting the data. You're, you're one of those. That's good. <laughs> um, you have state laws, a wide variety of state law that protects different kinds of data. Some states um, protect, you know, things that you understand why, why they were created. So we have some states that protect particularly careful sickle cell data in medical records, separate, dif differently. You have lots of HIV um, 
and AIDS kind of protections that, have, that popped up um, in the 80s and 90s, but not all the states have the same one. You can even find states that have protections on, you know, ophthalmologic data and other, just other kinds of bizarre things. So you have to talk to the program person who knows their data to understand what um, the rules are with respect to that data and try to find uh, a creative, you know, policy wonk or lawyer that's going to help you understand what the rules are and how you may fall into an exception so that you can use the data for your research. Um, I guess I, I want to mention the common rule. Um, so many of you know that the common rule is now, there's been a new proposal that just came out at the beginning of the month, last month, <laughs> as of today. Um, and so the, the proposal there, I mean, I urge everyone to read it, comment on it. The comments are due uh, at the beginning of December, I believe, on December 2nd. Uh, I don't know how much it was mentioned this morning. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah, um, it came up. So, and the idea behind the proposal is actually to make things a little bit less burdensome for researchers. Lots of different kinds of things have come up in the years, 30 years, 40 years, that since um, the, the common rule has been in place, that change the landscape of how research is done, multi-site kinds of things, and different kinds of data analysis. And so the rule is really intended to open things up a little bit more for researchers, and so I think you'll find that with respect to administrative data, it's going to change a little, and you should look particularly at that if that's, um, if that's something that you do regularly, which clearly this group does. I guess the other thing I would just add is that at each of these levels, you're going to find different level of sophistication of the people that you're dealing with. And so um, you, might take a, you might take into account that there's more or less experience the person that you're dealing with. And, so, for example, the Privacy Act has been around for 40 years. HIPAA, the implementation date was is not, you know, it's 80, whatever it was. We passed it in, you know, in 96. So in 2003, that, there's much less experience with HIPAA, and you'll find that at the beginning of the implementation of a law, you have what I would call overzealous lawyers who are very want to protect the data in ways it actually is not required by the law to be protected, and so you maybe can. Um, push a little and negotiate a bit and try to find out if there are ways to get access that um, that aren't, aren't, you know, let's say it's helpful to find a coalition or more than one voice um, at the table, and I think your approach is great to get more than the group of people at the table, um, because you sometimes find someone who is overly conservative about what can actually be done with the data, and that's not really helpful for the implementation of the original purpose of the law or for the kind of work that we're trying to do here. Are there other stakeholders we should be thinking about that are part of the decision for gaining access that we haven't talked about yet? Like IRBs, for example, um, the people who are actually giving the data, Maya touched on that early on. Are there other things that researchers should have in mind when they're thinking through this decision process at the beginning? We've touched on many of them. Okay. I mean, those things, like IRBs it's, and data are, governance boards are IRBs, important. IRBs, lawyers, kind of policy yeah. people, okay. security people, you're going to have for your data use agreement, you're going to have, uh, you know, your, yeah. We've hit on many of them, I think. I was just going to comment, too, that there's also a little bit of a conflict between the time constraints and the desire to have multiple people, you know, talk to all the stakeholders and have a scheduling that meeting <laughs> means it's going to be adding six months to the, you know, the time frame for doing something. So that, that is a, it's a tension. It's important to do it, but how do you do it and, you know, still do things in a timely fashion is, is tough sometimes. The, the only other comment that I would make is over the time period that I've been working in this area in terms of the data, and gov data governance boards within a state agency is when we first started working in this area 20 years ago, no agency had a data governance board and now almost all of them do mm -hmm. where they have their form where you have to submit your research request and that type of a thing and so I think it was mentioned before that there's been a, cha a lot of change over time yeah, about yeah. how we get this done. Um, so getting to know that data governance structure within an agency is part of the homework ahead of time. And you can know that. That can be known, um, what, how they govern their data, if it's about finding a person or if it's about finding a committee or a board.
So, so let's talk a little bit more about sticking points and actually creating um, data sharing agreements. Um, who, who are some of the people and what are some of the strategies that, that can be used with sticking points that come up with negotiating legal terms, IRBs, the idea of who owns the data, and then also more broadly, and I think this has come up already, um, the idea of how laws like HIPAA and FERPA are often really interpreted differently by different people. And oftentimes, and I think we heard this already this morning, those laws are maybe not often nearly as restrictive as, as the interpretation on the ground is. Well, we hit many so, sticking points. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just mention a few. Um, <coughs> Uh, one was, you know, a lot of state agencies want to review uh, things before they're published, and our, you know, our agreement with the federal government is that nobody can review things before they're published, except, you know, in, in, in an effort to maintain the independence of the evaluation, it's important to, you know, not have people think that, you know, state agencies can influence what's in it, or the programs we're studying can influence it, so it was important not to allow that to happen. So that was definitely a sticking point that, um, was uh, often we they, I think the agency just gave in, but um, the OPRE was willing to say let a state agency see something the day before it was released, so they at least know what it was. In one case, the state was mostly concerned about that we would use the data correctly and wanted to see the report to make sure we were doing that. So we agreed to set up regular meetings with them where we talk about what we're doing and really you know, go through the, the processing and that sort of thing, and that satisfied them. Um, the other big things I would say were, are about who would have access to the data. So we're planning to create a public use file. For example, it's, we call it a restricted access file because it won't be available to all the public, but there'll be some restrictions on who can use it. And that was you know, a sticking point to a lot of state agencies who are worried about um, confidentiality and uh, you know, all the issues that we've talked about. So we have you know, been working through exactly what will go into this restricted access file to make sure that the, states, the state agencies' um, needs are, you know, are met. I talked earlier about not being able to identify uh, particular, you know, particular states or even maybe particular local areas um, in, in the data. So making sure that's not just de-identified in kind of the normal ways, but even de-identifying states in, you know, in this example. Um, we also, there's also a provision in our contract with the federal government that um, they may decide they don't like the work we're doing and you know, in the future somebody else will be hired to do longer term follow up with families. So that's in our consent form and that's something we've raised with all of the state agencies. Um, and that's obviously, there's concern about, again, confidentiality issues and who's gonna have access to the data. Uh, and usually the solution to that is to say, if that happens, yeah, we're gonna do our best to do great work and probably that won't happen in the future, but um, if that happens, you get to, you know, wh whoever does it will have to reach an agreement with you and, and, and agree to the same confidentiality restrictions that we're agreeing to, and that was something that satisfied, um, satisfied people. So I'd say those are like some of the big things that I think came up. Um, in addition to some of the other, we talk, other ones we talked about, about not having the resources to provide the data. I think the ones that I just mentioned, though, are ones where the legal counsel really came in, um, in addition to just thinking about you know, the, the legalities of it. So I would say, from our, my perspective, having our own legal counsel was one of the biggest, you know, one of the most important things in this whole data acquisition process. So once the lawyer got involved, you know, we stepped back and let the lawyers talk to each other, um, and they could talk a, same, a similar language. Yeah, I was going to, I was just thinking while you were talking that I think our biggest sticking point has actually been when the lawyers don't agree. Um, and the, the, first, the first round of this study that I did, I was working for a very, very small private research company. And they basically, they didn't have legal counsel and they kind of signed whatever the state wanted them to in terms of data sharing agreements, which for better or worse. Um, and then I moved to the university setting where the lawyers look over all of the contracts. And for example, apologies to the lawyers in the room, but <laughs> I never thought I'd be spending so much time talking to lawyers and talking about contracts as a researcher. Um, but we have a basically a, a huge sticking point right now around um, people in New York, the, their contract, their legal office 
insists on having language saying that whoever signs this will follow all of the related New York, there's the line that says all of the related New York statutes governing data security and confidentiality, our office of Portland State will not sign that unless they detail and they can't, they said we can't spend the resources detailing all of the New York statutes statutes that we want you to follow and they say well how can we follow them unless we know what they are and they say well you guys need to go and research them and figure out what they are and our lawyers say well we don't have the resources to do that so we're essentially at loggerheads right now on this data sharing agreement because of the legal stuff drives me crazy sorry <laughs> um so I don't have that much more to add except for sometimes I end up telling people that I'm not a lawyer I just play one on tv because <laughs> in order to solve some of these problems we all have to get conversant in some of these areas, um, so we're not attorneys, but we need to have an understanding, uh, particularly around the different state laws, in, in my opinion, when we're doing a federal study, when we're doing something within the state. One of the tactics that has worked very, very well for us lately is when we've had issues with um, attorneys within particular departments within a state, if we have a relationship with a different department, we have asked, and, and it has worked quite successfully for the attorneys in that department, to they're not even involved, but to talk to the attorneys in the other state agency about how this can be done and, and why um, certain things can happen. And so what we've done, again, it's the over time, if we've had a successful relationship with one particular attorney or with one general counsel, they have actually voluntarily said, let me pick up the phone and talk to the, the attorney in the other state agency um, to talk to them about how to overcome these barriers. And it has worked very well. And we have been very, very good about being very thankful for the assistance that we've given, and not by an email, but by a meeting or picking up the phone, as been mentioned before. Because sometimes the attorneys, we have our attorneys at the university, but then the attorneys within a state agency trust more the attorneys at another state agency. Um, and so that's worked well for us. Can but I, you can't avoid these issues, that's for sure. I want to highlight something you just said, which I come across often, which is that you asked the right question, which is how can we do this? That's the question you want to ask your lawyer, not if we can do this, right? Because they're tempted to say no. But if you ask how can we do what it is we're trying to do within the law, that's the question you want to ask the lawyers. I'm not sure it will fix your problem. Yeah, <laughs> we tried that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I realized in the conversation that I missed my opportunity when we had the little previous segment, but, it, but I'm going to try to connect it to this one, which is um, I uh, staff an advisory committee to the secretary, the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics that some of you may be familiar with. And out of the privacy, confidentiality, and security committee there, we worked with our population subcommittee to put out a what we called a toolkit for communities using health data. And even though, it, so I would hold up a nice glossy one, but it's published electronically, and I will, however, the, the right way to do it is um, send a link to whoever the, the participants are here so that you can look at it. So the, the toolkit is meant for an audience which is probably less sophisticated than the people who are in this room, but could still be helpful, I think. And the, the idea is um, for people doing work with localities at various levels, so it could be neighborhood, could be county, it could be states, um, how they could um, use and connect health data to, uh, to do various kinds of research. And it talks about a variety of ways to do that, um, a, a, variety of, a variety of tools in the toolkit. One of them is certainly creating relationships in the way that, that we've been talking about here. And uh, so I, I want to highlight that. And another is, with respect to privacy and confidentiality, security, that sort of thing. It goes over what, what we in the privacy community call the fair information principles. When we think about using data, um, we think about a group of principles that underlie all of the work that we do. Privacy, for me, is not just can you get access to data, but it's a, it's a, a group of practices that have really to do with fairness. So it's did you give the person notice when you were collecting the information? Are you, are you only collecting the minimum amount that you need to collect to do the job? Have you defined carefully what that job is, what the purpose of your, your collection or gathering is? Um, and, and here we're essentially, I would say, <laughs> a little bit violating or stretching one of the major fair information principles, which is that you shouldn't use information collected for one purpose for another purpose without going back to get the consent of the original subject. Now, we're talking a lot about 
how to go about doing that in a fair way when, you, when it's impractical um, to get that consent most of the time. But you should, you should understand that that's something that privacy people think about. And then it, of course, talks about all those other, excuse me, life cycle things, security, privacy, and, um, and even destroying the data when you're no longer in need of it. And that also may be kind of anathema to people who are doing research. Well, we're going to keep it around because we might think of something later to do with it. So um, the toolkit talks about a variety of these things. And um, so the, the connection here is the engagement, it, you know, smo smoothing over the, the, the um, challenges, you can, you, can, you can certainly do a lot of that by having initially engaged the community, even the, even the subjects. So you're doing a study in a particular neighborhood or a county, trying to connect with the community there and figuring out what can they get, what are they going to get out of this work that you're doing, get them behind it. Often we find that uh, some work that states and localities are doing is because some group of citizens wanted the data to be able to show something that they're trying to prove, that they're trying to go to their city council or state government with. And they want a study done so they can find evidence for what it is they're trying to promote. And if you find those pockets, you may be able to tie in with those folks. And having that buy-in from the community, from the participants, is going to smooth over a lot of the kinds of challenges that we're talking about here. So I want to turn to one question that I think ties in some of the things that you just said, Maya, and some, some things that have come up even earlier this morning. And that is about. Um, creating public use data files. I think one of the things that we are doing more and more in federal government and other folks are doing, and that's having sometimes even a task in research contracts of creating a public use da data file at the end of contracts. So again, we can continue to use and learn from data that we have. And I wonder if, if you have thoughts on what the challenges and solutions are when thinking about whether and how to create a public use data file so that we can benefit from the data that we've worked so, far, so hard to get in future projects. And I'll start with you, Beth. Um, well, yes, I can comment on this. Uh, so for our, the first phase of our study, um, we didn't realize that part of the fine print of our contract with the CDC was to create a public use data set until the project was nearing completion. And so we had to go back to every single state and amend our data sharing agreements, um, which actually was problematic in a number of cases. They were very reluctant to do this. And basically, I mean, this is kind of the bad news in terms of that part of what the federal government is trying to do. We had to so aggregate the data for the, for the public use data set that I really felt like it's not really useful. Like, why would anyone ever want to use this data? It, it, it's not useful. Um, but we did it because it was in our contract. Um, and the state agency, a couple of state agencies also required us to send them the data set, their, their part of the data set to review prior to releasing it as a public use data set. So it, it was a sticking point. Um, it took a lot of resources to go back and do those <laughs> amendments, and I think ultimately was not that useful. Um, yeah, we were in a better situation because we knew we were, had to create a public use file before, <laughs> beforehand. Um, I, you know, I talked about some of the concerns that states had, and I think um, We've generally been able to overcome those. I think the only issue remaining is that often you know, we don't have, we haven't um, finalized the specification of the public use file, and we have an agreement in principle with each state agency that what we'll do will be okay. But um, yeah, we'll have to make sure you know, that it does follow the regulations in the end. Um, but I think the key for a lot of them was creating what we're calling a restricted access file that will require you know people signing forms and you know, really restricting you know who has access to it and what they intend to do with it so that it's not really a public use file. Yeah. And just to add um, just an example, I mean, I think I went into administrative data work 10 years ago or more thinking that de-identified meant um, take off names and birth dates, social security number, which we never had. And now, I mean, to de-identify these data sets to the level that the states wanted, we had to strip every single date we had to not have information about individual um, reports, even though it was coded. So it's a one instead of a zero instead of a 99. Um, so really, it's getting down to the level of data that, like I said, 
not that useful, especially when you get rid of dates. So we're nearing um, the time that we're going to turn it over to our discussant. But before doing that, I want to give everyone sort of an opportunity for some concluding <laughs> remarks and really to focus on what, um, what advice you would give to a new researcher who's never done this before. What stumbling blocks would you advise him or her about? Um, and then to talk maybe a sentence or two about if there was, you know, sort of one change that you could make to make it easier to access administrative data, what, what would it be? Let's start with Chuck okay. this time. Um, this I mean, to researchers, I'd say, I mean, we already touched upon this, the key thing is having a relationship with somebody in the state and having a champion in the state where we've done studies that have been, where the research has been designed in partnership with the state, anything was possible in terms of getting access to administrative data. In studies like the home visiting ones where the research has been driven you know, more at the federal level, um, you know, it's required a lot more you know, time and negotiations. I think that's the key thing. I think at the federal level, it's, uh, you know, one big thing is if we've, we've heard a number of places where perhaps federal agencies could assemble information that could be available to researchers such as who should you be contacting in state agencies to you know, try to do this. Um, um, what are the regulations across you know, different states and different state agencies? Um, uh, um, and, and federal agencies may be in a better position to also build relationships over time that we've talked about rather than researchers who might come in and you know, need the data for one study but may not. You have it where we, we've collected unemployment insurance data in California for 30 something years and we have no problem doing that but if it's an agency we haven't worked with uh, then yeah that may be, a, may be um, more of an issue um, one other uh, I know I was only supposed to throw out one but one other idea just a colleague had mentioned is uh, wondering whether the federal government could also work with state attorney general's offices to try to get them to issue cross-agency um, you know, information about what, what state agencies are allowed to do so you don't have to negotiate with each state agency. And then also whether um, you know, the federal government could provide researchers with some sort of certifications that they could provide to states saying, we're nice guys, we'll protect your data, <laughs> um, and all of that, and maybe that would smooth. <laughs> so I had basically the exact same comments. Um, my big piece of advice, again, comes back to this relationship building. And when we were first starting out, we would have conversations with state agencies about we had a research agenda. So there was yours, mine, and ours. There was a research agenda we had. There were questions they were interested in. And, over t and then over time, it became much more of a our sort of research agenda. Um, and it is getting the buy-in, uh, you know, I believe much as, as you had said. Um, my wish list also had to do at the federal level. And it was about um, something I touched on this morning in terms of clearer guidelines on the federal level about permissions. One of the things that we build into every single agreement that we reach with a researcher to use the data that we've integrated is that they have to be able to articulate how it will inform and improve the program or policy that gave us the data to get, to get around this, you know, it was collected for a different purpose. Um, but essentially, yes, it was collected to run the program, but if we can do research that will help improve the program, then again, it's the your, mine, and ours um, sort of perspective. But one of the big challenges is when we go to work with new agencies or new data sets is to, is to really um, embed that concept that what we're actually trying to do is not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. And if there was a way to, I don't know if it's a certificate, you know, someone saying we're good guys and we're here to help and all of that, I don't know. But um, definitely because things are all over the map and you're, you're, de you're renegotiating over and over again what you thought was a concept you had figured out if there was just like one go-to place, like a toolkit like you were talking about or something like that, that would be really nice. Um, what would I tell a new researcher? Uh, I guess I would try to say, you know, bake the privacy in, <laughs> right? Start at, I maybe stole my own thunder from the beginning, right? But, <laughs> you know, think about the entire life of the project that you're doing at the beginning and try to, at each step, know what the, what the privacy rules are um, at those steps and, and plan for that in advance. Um, I'm not sure you really want me to answer. <laughs> how, how can I make access to data easier? But I will. <laughs> um, and, I, and I guess I would say that try, try to be, you know, try to anticipate, and this is part of, well, I have two things, really. Um, try to anticipate what your partner in the project is dealing with. You mentioned um, legal matters and policy matters, but also budget issues. 
uh, and try to anticipate those and have thought about them before you, we approach those people. Um, and then I think for me, the one thing that it comes up, it came up less often here, but I hear often, I wish I could change the language about how we talk about this. You know, I wrote down some of the words um, that I heard here, barriers, hoops, impediments, roadblocks, you know, how can we get around the problem, right? Which, which is just a way of speaking, but um, for me, you know, the privacy rules, as I said before, are the way you get the data, because if people are not confident, as I said before, you're not gonna get the data at all. From a health point of view, if people are not, for example, um, comfortable talking to their physicians and candid with them, you're, you know, we have a public health problem on our hands, right? If people don't tell their doctors about their STDs or their HIV status, I mean, there are actually um, real consequences to that. So I wish we could change the language around this and just say, look, this, you know, I don't like the idea of, of we talk about privacy balancing with things. I really don't like that metaphor because it implies that if we have more privacy, we have less of something else, or we have more data access, we have less privacy. I much prefer the metaphor that a, a rising tide lifts all boats. We can get both. We can do things in a privacy protective way and get the research done. And that's how we should, that's how I wish we would think about the problem going forward. Yeah, I don't have much to add <laughs> um, to what has already been said. I would echo the, you know, anything that could make the process of access more consistent, either across agencies within a state or across states, would be such a huge, I think, advantage. And by consistent, I mean, do you have to go through another IRB? Do you have to, what kind of security do you have to have on your, you know, hardware software? Um, what kind of language needs to be in there? Anything like that I think would be helpful. Um, in terms of what I would tell a new researcher, I guess I would say, and this has to do with relationships, you know, see if you can find a researcher who's already built that relationship and tag on um, and work with them because they probably know who to talk to. Um, one of the things that we started doing in Oregon, although I'll say we have had limited success, but we got a group of researchers together, all of whom were at various processes for various projects, ask, asking our state agency, um, child welfare agency, for data. And we thought maybe we could coordinate our requests better so that the state doesn't feel like they're being bombarded with a million different requests for a million different projects, at least in terms of figuring out what is a core set of data elements that we're all interested in and can all agree on. Um, and I actually thought that had some promise <laughs> in terms of, you know, let's work together since there's now quite a few researchers in the state who would like to have access to this data. So I'm hoping we can move that along, but that might be another thing to help with access. Great, let's keep going right down the line to Kelly, who's now gonna serve as our discussant. Thank you, this has been a great uh, discussion and I'm, I'm very excited to be here for all today and tomorrow morning. So my job was just to uh, highlight a few of the takeaways um, that I have from this conversation and so I, I will admit that I've had the benefit of a planning call that was also a very intense uh, discussion as well as the comments that were made today. So I think the first takeaway point I have is that access is like an onion. There are many layers to it, and I hope it doesn't make us cry when we're working on it. <laughs> um, the first layer I want to mention is availability, and I think sometimes we don't think about that, but access is really availability. Do the data exist? Does the program or agency uh, gather the data, or do they gather a uh, something that is kind of similar to what you might be able to use, but not quite. So availability is the first layer for me. The second layer is the physically getting the data. And I think that's often what we think of first when we think about access. And that's the things like establishing data sharing agreements and many other steps to actually getting the portion of the data set that you need to answer your question. The third layer, though, is oftentimes our questions require not just data from one data set, but actually merging data from multiple places in order to have all of the data we need to answer the question. So I think the third layer is really the, the issue of merging the data in order to truly have access to the information you need. And I'm looking forward to the session that I think is at the end of today that's going to talk a little bit about challenges and opportunities with linking. And then finally, the last layer for me, the fourth layer, is understanding what the data mean and don't mean. And that is um, 
a critical issue that uh, Maria's example this morning was fabulous about she was ready to go down that road about understanding why uh, people were moving. And if she hadn't gone and talked to that person, she wouldn't have really understood all of the issues that surround uh, why that particular code was coming up so important. So I think understanding the meaning for me uh, is about understanding the quality of the data that are collected, um, the quality and how the data are entered into the system, how the variables were defined, as well as the policy context. And all of those layers are really important when we think about access. The second thing is relationships are critical. As everybody has said here, um, and as we know throughout uh, lots of aspects of our lives. And I think it is really critical to develop um, trusting, mutually beneficial relationships among all the stakeholders who are necessary in order to use administrative data to answer important questions. Um, Jennifer talked a lot about taking the time when you're working with within a single state or a single agency, um, many things you can do to develop a long-term relationship. Chuck has a different challenge and I think in my head it's kind of like speed dating. Um, he had to develop relationships with a lot of agencies in a lot of states. So I know I for one am looking forward to the informal networking session tonight because I'm going to ask him um, a little bit more about that because I think he has lessons learned for us who are doing or interested in doing multiple um, state work with administrative data. My third takeaway um, is related to what Maya said at the end here and I want to use the phrasing she used on the planning call which is it's both and not either or. Um, that really we shouldn't think about privacy and confidentiality as the bad bad guy that really we need to think about in order to do our research well, we have to think about both uh, confidentiality and privacy and access issues. The fourth takeaway is that we need to build capacity among all of us, researchers, administrative organizations that house the data and funders. Um, and capacity was the first thing that Beth mentioned today when asked about challenges. Um, the amount of data that we have available is growing, as is the technology that we have to use it and the analytic techniques that we have, as well as the laws and policies that govern the use of data is growing and likely to continue to grow and evolve. So I think it's a big challenge for all of us to just keep up with all of this. Um, and I think we need to think about building capacity at multiple levels of the system. So thinking about capacity at the local program level in the community at the county level, at the regional level possibly, at the state level and federal level. I also think we need to think about multiple aspects of capacity. So I'm sure there are millions of aspects of capacity, but I'm gonna mention a few here. And the first one I wanna start with is data systems. Do the programs and organizations have the data systems to support their storage and use of administrative data? My guess is that most programs and organizations are really um, limited with what they can do because of their data systems. The second um, thing I want to mention is expertise. And when I think about expertise, I typically think about the expertise in the organizations that have the administrative data, that they either need to have staff in-house that understand um, what the data mean and how to use it and analyze it, or they need to partner with somebody outside of their organization who has that expertise, who can help them uh, utilize the data to answer their policy questions. And that brings me to the uh, fourth, third aspect I want to mention, which is related to that, but more broadly about culture. I think part of capacity is this broad organizational culture that values data and values the use of data in making decisions. So that's another aspect. And then finally, the last thing I want to mention is knowledge. And of course, we all have to stay up to date in particular areas of our expertise that we work in. And I think we all, again, have to stay knowledgeable about the laws and policies that govern the data. So we can turn to experts and maybe our new best friends like Maya and the friendly lawyer John who can provide <laughs> advice about that. And there are also a growing number of resources out there to help us and our partners understand these issues. So I just want to mention one of those today. Um, research Connections uh, promotes high quality early care and education research and the use of that research. 
So even though they are focused primarily on early care and education, I think the, some of the resources that they have really apply um, to broader areas. And I want to talk today about one of the pages that they have on their website that has pulled together a variety of resources about using administrative data. So I think part of the challenge is I might know about a resource that's over here, but I might not know about resources over there. Or our state partners might not even really know where do I turn if I want to learn a little bit more about how to set up a data sharing agreement. So Research Connections has tried to pull a range of resources together in organizing them. So they have brief descriptions and links of things like the ACF Confidentiality Toolkit, and they also have links to other websites like the Privacy Technical Assistance Center that you could, you know, kind of while you're there thinking about all of these issues, click and go to other websites that are related to using administrative data. And then finally, I want to end uh, with, again, a point can, that Maya said can during you tell us before you, oh. Can you tell us more about who Research Connections So Research are? Connections is funded by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. That's us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And you can go to, I think it's www.researchconnections.com. They, they, dot dot org. org. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, they have a well, I mean, it's, it's primarily focused on early childhood research, but again, because of this issue of there's a growing number of resources out there about working with administrative data, but they're all in multiple places, we are trying to pull things together. Thank you. Uh, yeah, talk to somebody at OPRA, uh, maybe uh, Murr, right? You're the person who, if you have more <laughs> questions about research connections. And again, finally, I want to end with the point that Maya said on the planning call, which is to remind us that there's a person behind every data point. And I think when we are reviewing spreadsheets or statistical reports, that can be something that we forget. But I hope we will remember during this meeting and beyond the children, families, service providers, and others who are behind the data that we're using. Thank you. Thank you. We have almost 15 minutes for questions. There are microphones up front. So if, if folks have questions, please come forward and, um, and we will keep going. And I guess while people are coming forward, I'll give a minute to see if panelists have questions for each other. I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, you, might, you might have to get closer to it. <laughs> yeah, she's not. Okay. Flip the it's not working. <laughs> yeah. I'm good now? Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. This has all been really interesting um, and helpful. I wanted to ask you a little bit more to talk about data ownership. And I heard two things referred. One was, the owner of the data, but also Maya used the term custodian of the data, and the fact that the privacy rules might change with the custodian of the data. So what's the difference between a data owner and a data custodian? And I ask this partly because as a faculty member at a public university, I'm advised that when I get data uh, through a data sharing agreement that I also sign, it has a great name, it's a materials transfer agreement. I think that's what it's called. Um, basically, it says, I don't own the data that you've just given me. Because if someone files a Freedom of Information Act and asks me for my data because I'm at a public university, I might have to turn it over to them regardless of whether or not it was given to me you know, with whatever confidentiality agreement I've signed. So no one's ever tested that, as far as I know. Um, but anyway, I wondered if anyone else had that experience, but also just this question about ownership versus custodian. So, so maybe I should jump in, thank you. Um, because I'm a lawyer, when I think about the term ownership, that implies to me all kinds of property rights and other kind of very complex, long, you know, list of property laws that goes back to, you know, civil law in England or something. And we, I don't usually think about data that way because, well, first of all, if you're at a public university or here we are at the federal government ownership, I mean, who owns the data? The taxpayers own the data, right, really. Um, we're collecting it on behalf of the taxpayers to do work for them. We don't 
I did use the word ownership, I realized earlier, but I meant, you know, in the colloquial way, the program person owns their data because they're responsible for it, but, but I try to use the word custodian because, um, so l let me give you an example. In the HIPAA privacy law, there's a lot of people who wanted us to say, well, who owns the data? Well, if you think about it, you know, it's, it's, if you're the patient, it's your data, it's about you, right? But you're, it's, the, it's, the, it's the result of your doctor's intellectual work it's, uh, you know, the, it's, it could, you could make an argument that it's owned by the insurance company that paid for those services. You could make an argument that it's the hospital, you know, who provided the facilities. It doesn't make sense to really think about ownership because so many different people have a, or so many different parties have, a, have an argument that they own the data. So, so most privacy law, and I think maybe the way we can think about it is, if you got the data right now and you're, you're the, another word, a steward of that data, right? So in the toolkit, we talk about data stewardship. How is the proper way to manage that data while you're the person responsible for it? And, and so it's true, I, ownership is, I find not very useful as a metaphor. Right? But can you talk, oh, I was, can you talk more about what you meant by custodian? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I just meant the person who, who is responsible for that data where it is at the moment, and that might be, for a federal agency, that's the federal program office. Um, you know, for a state, that's the state agency. For, for a university, that could be just the, the PI for that particular project. So it, it could be at different levels, but the custodian is, I guess, at bottom, who is the person whose neck is on the line if something goes wrong, right? Um, the, the only comment that I would make also at a public university is we're really very clear with the data, with the merge data set that we've created that I guess the right language would be that at that point in time we're the custodians, but we don't have ownership. It's the state agency's data. So for, in order for it to be used, we need to go back to the state agency from whom we got it because we have the whole population across multiple systems to get permission to use it. So we cannot just release it, right? So we're, we're in the same situation that it sounds like you're in. Um, but it is interesting to think about this custo you know, custodian language because clearly part of when I talk about relationships and relationship building over time, I personally feel like I have an obligation to be very um, aware of and professionally cognizant of my responsibilities and relationships to that data. And so therefore, it just can't be used willy-nilly because I'm the custodian at that point. So I understand, you know, the language that you're using in terms of my responsibility as. Right, and right. I think the other thing to say is that that responsibility doesn't necessarily come from the organization who is the custodian, right? It could come right. from, from state, federal law. Right. It could come from your data use right. agreement, so that's a contract kind of thing. It could come from your university's policy. It could come from a lot of different places that you're having to manage, but as the custodian, you're managing right. whatever the imposed rules are for that data at that time. Um, I would just add, I, I can't really speak to the ownership. I think our understandings, also a public university, is similar to Jennifer's, um, that we are the custodians of the data. Um, that said, I'm not familiar with the process that you um, talked about in terms of protecting the data from subpoena. We do do a lot of work with child welfare agencies, so we do get subpoenaed um, for data occasionally, a handful of times in the past five years. Um, and typically with administrative data, we just say, this is the same, we have the data that the state has. So, you know, if you want this data, you already have it, essentially. Um, so, and so they've never pushed us on that. Um, finish your thought. But yeah, you and then I was just going to say, other kinds of data that we've collected as researchers through interviews and things like that, we do have a federal certificate of confidentiality that protects it from subpoena. <laughs> um, so we have used that mechanism. Different. That's what I was going to yeah. add. Yeah. Specific, you know, about certificates yeah. of confidentiality. Yeah. Alita. Um, to get closer. Speak loud. There's the. Yeah. There you, go. <laughs> you just have to get close to it. So um, I work with a number of folks. Maria Wolverton is leading this project where we're working specifically on um, creating a. National, uh, nationally representative database of um, American Indian Alaska Native Head Start centers. And I, I did notice that no, I did not hear when I was in the room anybody talk about issues around working with sovereign nations, working with tribal communities. And one thing I was just so happy to hear you all talk about was this issue around what the data mean and don't mean. 
and really thinking about interpretation with the stakeholders and sort of the moral responsibility to make sure that data are not interpreted without input from those stakeholders. So I was wondering if, um, I guess I see Beth nodding. I was wondering if any of you would be willing to share if you have done some work with sovereign nations around these issues. I, I um, think it's important to make sure we talk about it today. Yeah. yeah, I haven't personally, but I have colleagues who do. Um, and I know that the, my understanding at least is that the, the sovereign nations um, own their own data and that that is a totally separate process for, even if they're part of a federal grant, and there are federal officers here who can speak to this more than I, um, that they still own their data. So there's a whole separate layer of process that has to go on in terms of working with uh, American Indian nations and tribes. Can I add to that? So um, during the process of working on the toolkit that I mentioned to you at the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, we did hear from um, representatives of the tribes and a couple of very interesting things. Are there people in the room who are familiar with the Havasupai case? A few of you. So I'll tell you briefly. The Havasupai are the tribe that lives in the basin of the Grand Canyon. And there was a famous research study at Arizona State um, that was looking into uh, and taking samples of the Havasupai people with their permission on diabetes, which is rampant in that community. And the data were later repurposed and used to do a study of schizophrenia and also used to do a study on migration patterns that, that published a result that differed from the Havasupai's own story about their origins. And the tribe was really unhappy, sued Arizona State, and they paid out a $750,000 um, penalty for having done that without the proper authority. So, so two things from that. Some of the things that I've already said about um, is, is, as you said, to involve the, the community and, and the, the people that you're doing with and remember that there's, a, there's people underneath this. But something that we didn't mention, or we mentioned in passing, which is that it, it's not exactly privacy, but there is a kind of idea of the privacy of a group of people, right? Not individual privacy, which I usually think about, but is there something to saying something about a particular group that stigmatizes that group? And so how do you think about reporting out uh, there's a high incidence of, uh, you know, schizophrenia in this population or a high incidence of alcohol in this population? Does that stigmatize that population, how, what happens to that population as a result in their community or with other people that they deal with if it's known? Um, does that advantage or disadvantage that group? And so we have to think about the reporting out of that kind of result as well, which, which goes to some of the things that, in particular small communities like tribes, if they're the small ones, um, do care about quite a lot. And the same issue, I guess we mentioned when we talked about the state not wanting to have their state known as the you know, last in a list of whatever it is we're measuring for the same kinds of reasons. Um, hi, I'm Nicole Dutterding. I'm a postdoc at OPRE. Um, and so I'm coming sort of from just finishing a PhD and being in academia more. And I think today people here have really been for very good reason, both practical and sort of ethically on the side of building mutually beneficial relationships with the people who own the data. But there is sort of out there in the world another um, sort of thing that I think is in tension with that, which is just we need freer access to administrative data. Um, I was at a, a Hill briefing the other day and a very prominent ac academic sort of told the group, go home and tell your bosses we need more access to administrative data, right? So what would you say very directly to the people who are pushing for that um, and in a world in which um, data owner's time is limited? Um, how do you balance sort of the time that it takes to build these really strong relationships and maybe freer access to the data? I mean, I have something to say. So, uh, so I have a little note here actually that's sort of on that topic, um, which is that uh, certainly the administration has is promoting um, you know public access to data and uh, we have data.gov and other ways of getting data out to the public. And for the per basically for whatever purpose people might make of it, the, the latest cool app or whatever it is. Um, but I think, I think that's intention with the idea that when you make inferences from data, out there unstructured and out, well maybe not unstructured, but at least without, um, 
information about what that data is and what that data was collected for and what the limitations of that data are without some kind of metadata about what does this data mean, which we've talked about a little bit. People who you know, freely access the data because they're making the latest cool app or, or trying to make some cool study without a sophisticated knowledge of what the data is, you can make inferences of data that were collected for another purpose, but that's dangerous because you may find uh, you know, that, that infer those inferences are just wrong, right? That they're just not, you find correlations that have nothing to do with causation and so forth. We're familiar with that problem. And so there is, I think, a tension between those two things and we do think about that a lot um, at HHS and the federal government when we talk about making public use data files and we talk about disseminating data, we're thinking about how to, how to better create that metadata so that there's a way to track back what, what was that data collected for and what did it mean at the time it was collected because when you use it for another purpose, you are going away from what the meaning of that data is and that is not necessarily a good thing. And as a follow up to that, I think one of um, the ongoing things that we try to manage day to day it, is this balance and in so much as, as I was saying before, if, if, if as a researcher you're just interested in um, what I call the one off, like you just want to get the data to accomplish what you want to accomplish. and and it, it can, I don't know if the right word is to say ruin for the good of the order, but you have to remember there's a, a bunch of us that want to have access to that information and be able to use it in a responsible manner to inform policy and practice, which is what I'm all about. And you can damage relationships that somebody else has built over time by inappropriate or what you think is appropriate, but sort of um, cavalier use of the data. So I do think there is this really strong tension and I'm all for, I'm a, I'm a give me everything you have type of a person and then back off of it, you know, um, as far as the data goes. But I'm also super protective of understanding. I had in my notes as well the, the concept of remember these are people on the other end of the data. Um, it, this is just about, you know, fun and games with research and then we have to remember that. And we have to remember that this again it should be all about improving, you know, programs and policies in practice and not getting just the next journal article, which is a conversation that I frequently have. It's not just about the journal article, it's about what can it be done to improve policy and practice for the people whose data that we're using. Even if it's not in the direct instance, like when you write your IRB protocol, how is this going to benefit the individuals that you're studying, and you really, it's not, but over time, people like them, um, it could be benefiting. And so again, it is a really strong balancing act, and, and just this free, unfettered, without this basic understanding, to me, is very challenging and problematic and actually threatens our work going forward, doesn't enhance it. We did, in the, in the hearings that we did with the, with the National Committee that I mentioned, hear a lot about this concept of helicoptering, uh, you know, uh, researchers who come in, collect the data, you know, publish their paper, put it on their CV, get their tenure, and we never see them again. And I think, you know, perhaps we need a new way of thinking about this. Maybe we need to think about the ethical obligation of mm -hmm. using the data and tr feeding that back to the community or the, the people who, who are the subjects of that data. Great. On that note, it brings us, I think, about exactly to noon. So first, join me in, in thanking our fabulous panelists.